Hello and welcome to the Boyce of Reason podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's guest is Dr. Dina McMillan, who is a social scientist specializing in domestic violence. She's been watching the spread of so-called anti-racist training across America, the stuff that's based on critical race theory. She's very concerned that it will backfire because it's not based on science, but rather on certain social principles or social ideas that to her mind are highly manipulative and condition people to be open to more and more manipulation. Down there in the description are links to her work. I highly suggest you follow her on Twitter and check out her podcast and her anti-bias training, which she is currently developing, will be released periodically starting I think she already has a video out right now, but there will be more released quite soon. So without further ado, here's Dr. Dina McMillan. Now, where are you located? I'm in Washington State, um, uh, Olympia. Washington State, okay. One of my um, work colleagues that I'm co-authoring a book with, I'm actually the main author and she's co-authoring it with me, is her name is Carolyn West. Mm -hmm. She's a professor at the University of Washington, psych psychology professor, who oh. specializes in domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking as concerns black women. So I have a book called Buddy Says. I actually have it here because I was reading it for, because I'm writing the new one. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like, called Buddy Says He Loves Me. Okay. And we're doing Buddy Says He Loves Me too specializing in protection, specializing for black women. So we're actually taking the general information, customizing it to black American culture mm. and putting that out. Should be finished by Christmas. So is, but he says he loves me, is that a story about the ways in which women are treated or is it kind of advice for women to uh, kind of understand what's happening to them? Well, what happened is it's in 2007, I came up and still, as far as I know, the only prevention program for domestic violence, which is weird. You, when I came up with it, I thought, surely somebody else has done this, you know, but I looked it up and no, I'm a, because I'm a social psychologist. So we study influence, interaction, social learning manipulation, coercion. And if you look at my, my Twitter feed where you and I met, it's you, you see it woven through everything. When I talk about how, when I see things I call influence mechanisms, where information is, is presented in a certain way to be very emotionally evocative, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a way of embedding it into the part of the brain that makes the bulk of our, our life decisions, but has no filter, and it's not rational. So once things get in there, it's why sometimes when you present people with an opposing viewpoint, no matter how strong your case, they won't listen. And everybody's heard of cognitive dissonance, right? Oh, yeah. We've all experienced it, too, I'm sure. Okay. Right now. <laughs> well, that cognitive dissonance, for the most part, comes because information isn't just in the neocortex in the logical rational part of the brain it's actually embedded in your limbic brain and okay. your reptilian brain yeah which hold on to information um and are very sensitive to the touch so when you touch something there it's it's very tender so it causes a lot of cognitive dissonance so smart influencers Try to get information past your, your neocortex, past your logical, rational brain and into those other parts of the brain because they can trigger them at will and they know once something is embedded there, it's really hard to pull it out. Okay. So um, what I realized after working in domestic violence for years was that abusers actually use specific manipulation tactics to embed information in those parts of the brain that I just discussed, the limbic brain, the reptilian brain. And regardless of where they come from, they're using the same set of tactics. Hmm. 
So basically, it's like 15 tactics, just 15 tactics used by everybody. But there is some variation because part of the how it's used is cultural. So when I do training for women, I like to, to use cultural norms to explain how their abusers are going to try to get through. But in general, once you know the tactics, you know the tactics. And okay. you don't just see them romantically. Once you understand the tactics, you can tell if it's being used by friends, by a social cause, by a political movement, by your boss or the organization you work for. Once you know it, as I say on my Unmasking the Abuser podcast series, it's like having a superpower. All of a sudden, it's like you can see another color. You can see ultraviolet Mm -hmm. where nobody else can. So in the book, the book, one of the reasons I always show people the book when I do seminars is not just because they actually designed a really clever cover. Hmm. Um, I show it to them this way because it's very unusual to get a book that has this kind of core information in it and it's not very long. Yeah, it's very distilled. I designed it to be read in one go. I, I designed it for people who don't normally read books who only look at magazines or whatever. Yeah. And the way I did it was I have, unlike most people who work in domestic violence, I have extensive in-depth information and contact with abusers as well as victims and survivors. So what I did was, one of the things I realized is that most victims and survivors have no clue how their partners actually think. But these guys were incredibly open with me about how they think because they knew I was under oath to never reveal what they told me. What they told me has to go with me to my grave. So what I did in the book, on the left-hand page, throughout the book, it says the abuser's handbook at the top. And what I did is I made an amalgam of all the abusers I'd spoken with, took out the bad language so that you can give, you know, young people can read it, And I actually explained, it's like the voice of a guy saying to other men, hey, this is how you train your women. On the right-hand page, it's in my voice, as I talk about, this is what it looks like Hmm. when someone, when an abuser is trying to manipulate you into a relationship. And I start at the very beginning. So that's what I normally do. Mm -hmm. But with all of the protests we've had, with Black Lives Matter and the, the, you know, all the cities being set on fire and looking at the programs that are being offered to address racism. Of course, I have extensive training in bias and intergroup matters. That's one of my specialties when I was in graduate school. So I had two, you had to specialize in two things. I had interpersonal relationships and social stratification. So looking at the um, relationships between different groups in society. Um, And I'm looking at what's being taught, the anti-white rhetoric that's going on, the self-hatred that's being advocated. And I felt like I have to do something. So that's why I put my Healing the Rift program together. Mm -hmm. Because I felt people had to have an alternative. You can learn about bias without having that rhetoric and that that philosophy that all white people are bad, all cultural norms previous to the current period were all evil, we have to tear down our history, none of that is helpful. So if you want to know what I do, that's what I do. Those are my two things, domestic violence and prevention. I I went to a conference in 2019 in, in September in Oslo, I was invited to speak and do a workshop at the European Conference on Domestic Violence, which is huge. And I looked at everything being offered. I looked and I went to as many events as I could. I still have the only prevention program. So define prevention in the context of domestic violence then. Prevention is on an individual basis. So we're not talking about, we have the prevention programs you see now are all about, we need to have gender equality, that kind of thing. They're more like social 
changes and cultural norm changes that will discourage domestic violence, but they don't help people now. They don't help people on the ground. Mine works with society exactly the way it is because it shows you specifically what tactics of an abuser will use to try to manipulate you into a relationship. Could could we kind of do two things at the same time and show, because I've been studying very deeply the current anti-racist uh, pedagogy. Mm. And some of the tracks or some of the propaganda that comes out is, it just, it feels like an abusive relationship. It feels yeah, like sucking people. So what what's something that, that works interpersonally, but you also see operating within this program that we could, that you could explain to us and then explain how to counter that? Or, or okay. I guess to recognize it and diffuse it if it's coming okay. after us. Well, I would say that's exactly what's happened. Over the past five years especially, It's I'm old enough that I can actually reference 20 years, the 20 years I've been a professional. And over that 20 years, I have been stunned and appalled, even causes that I am aligned with. I have noted them using the same tactics as abusers in order to gain support and to silence dissent. So this this issue we're seeing now is not recent. I, I, I'm sure it happened even before, but I didn't have the education or the intellect at that point. I didn't have the executive thinking. I, my brain wasn't old enough to have all that complexity. It was still seeing things in black and white. Mm. So as... I got a bit older, also went through graduate school, started my profession. I've been seeing so much of in society where causes are and social movements are using these tactics. One thing they're doing is they're throwing, okay, here's one thing that's a perfect example. They always use a really sympathetic, harmless person to support a cause, okay? And you have somebody you know, they can do the quivering lip on cue, like if you ever saw uh, Puss in Boots, one of the things that's hilarious, if you see Shrek and then you see Puss in Boots, he is so lethal with his sword, but whenever he gets caught or threatened, he does the big kitty eye thing and he, he makes his little lip quiver and the tears start to come and he gets away with it. They're like, oh, cute kitty. And then he pulls out his sword. and So they get somebody who's really sympathetic, they put them in the front, they say, look, and the person says, all I want is to be treated like a human being. And how can you argue with that, right? Now, behind the scenes, though, they're implementing things to support that person and saying, if you don't agree with this person, you want that person to die. You want that person to be completely obliterated. So anybody with any empathy, sympathy, or compassion is told you have to do this, but it quickly morphs yeah. into if you don't give this person exactly what they ask for, you want the most extreme bad thing to happen that, to that person. So it's like foot in the, they use a victim as a foot in the door. They use a, a really sympathetic case as a foot in the door. They use a small ask as a foot in the door, because we social psychologists know that once you get that foot in the door, you can quickly ask for bigger and bigger concessions, and the chances are good they'll say yes. They've already been taught in those parts of the brain we were talking about before to give in to you. So I'm, I'm watching all these causes. As I said, whether I'm aligned with them or not, I'm looking at the methods they're using to gain approval and it's terrifying me. Why is it terrifying you? Because it's it's conditioning people to give in to abusers' tactics. You'll find that people that have been in abusive relationships are vulnerable to being manipulated in all sorts of ways because our brains adapt to our circumstances. So when you're adapting to overlooking Thing, anything you don't want to be true. You're adapting to not being treated fairly. You're adapting to, you know, small con uh, verbal concessions or people saying nice things, not followed by behavior, 
but that's the most you can get, you've adapted to that. So when it comes in the form of a social cause, when it comes in the form of a political movement, when it comes in the form of the organization you work for, even if in the dark of the night, sometimes you complain, oh, look at how I'm treated, you're not going to actively take steps to oppose it because your brain has normalized it. It has convinced you this is your lot in life. So by allowing, by having social movements that are teaching people this, they are increasing the probability that my domestic violence work is not, is always going to be in demand. I don't want that work to be in demand. I'd like to do, get, do the anti-bias work and I want to be an interior designer. I don't want to work with this stuff. I thought I'd be done by now. This book came out in 2007. I thought I'd be finished with this by now. How do you reach people who have already uh, been swept up in that path? Or how do you empower people to start to become skeptical again once they're already kind of swept up in an abusive relationship, whether it's the cause or an inter, uh, interpersonal relationship? One of the things I'm looking for is to get sufficient support in the United States to get out in front because I can say things that you can't. And not only number one reason I can say them is because I'm black. Number two, because I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. Number three, because that PhD from Stanford actually counts. Thank you. I went when they, when they actually, it, it was a real degree. Okay. I didn't put my race on my application to Stanford because I didn't want anybody ever to be able to say you got in because you're black. And when I got there, I have never faced such overt racism in my life. It okay. is absolutely an amazing thing that I ever graduated. Okay? Really? That Yes, that's a whole other story. But the the I have the background to say what I'm saying. I have the expertise to say what I'm saying. And I'm saying it as a black woman. So I'm looking at, the, so that gives me an emotional end. Because first of all, people don't learn if they're feeling defensive. So when I get up there and I stand in front of them, I am not right wing. I'm not any wing. I think wings belong on angels and birds. So I am a social scientist. Okay. That is my personhood. It's above religion. I am a social scientist. So I stand in front of them. A lot of the people who've already bought into that anti-racist rhetoric will not be immediately guarded with me, which is an advantage. And then when I start talking to them, I need to be able to have advertising, internet, you know, internet ads, public service announcements. I need to be able to have emotional content to fight emotional content. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot fight emotional, emotionally embedded content with intellectual rhetoric. You cannot. Mm -hmm. We have to give ourselves an opportunity to go in and actually pull out almost like an operation, pull out some of that rhetoric, some of that belief system that will result only in um, a population, a segment of our population who is so self-hating that they're incredibly easy, easy to manipulate on a macro level and on a micro level. I don't want that to happen. So, but I do need to get out there. People have to give, you know, right now you have a few people like uh, like Candace and a few other people that are black and, but they're unapologetically conservative. So when they come up against people who are anti-racist, well, you just say that because, you know, you're, you're right wing and you're a Trump yeah. supporter. And I'm basically just a social scientist. So what is, what is your program then healing the rift? What, what, mm-hmm. what's the, the foundational principles or, or the, the, the values at the core of it? Racism still does exist. Okay. Racism still negatively impacts black Americans we can do something to address racism that actually works 
but does not displace anti-black beliefs with anti-white beliefs. Nobody wins that way. Nobody wins. And the people advocating for it just want to make money and to manipulate people. Like if you see that Ashley Shackelford talk that is all over, look at look her up. Ashley, and it's spelled A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H, Ashley Shackelford. Um, she has a talk on that where she's giving one of those anti-racism talks. Yeah. And she stands in front of a, a, a white sheet that has in big letters, all white people are racist. Yeah, that one. <laughs> and beneath that, it says, PayPal me. So... Uh, the video yeah. she calls them demons too yes. it's really over the top yes and people are actually sending her money um yeah penance or yeah and i'm looking at that people who feel guilty people with good hearts yeah see i'm looking at these people who are you know staunch anti-trumpers and, and you know want buy into the whole black lives matter movement who actually show you, if you actually go on their site, they tell you who they are. They aren't sending money to black communities. They aren't about black um, education or doing something about the issues that cause racism to still be so prevalent because the discrimination that was set up before, the systemic aspects, the shadows of that are still there. Yeah, They don't address that at all. They want to blame everything on the cops. And support their agenda, which will not take black people forward. First, if you, the first step to doing anything to improve ourselves is we have to admit where we are vulnerable. We have to admit where we have made choices that have not benefited us. By always blaming an outside source, taking no responsibility for yourself, what you're teaching is you're teaching people to act that way. So it's no surprise that the protests have been linked with extensive looting, violence against anybody who believes differently. Once you go to that side of our nature where nothing's my fault, I'm entitled to things I haven't earned, it grows and it gets uglier and uglier. And what it's going to do is make racism rational. If I feel like if I hire a black employee, anytime something happens to a, a, a black career criminal in another state who resists arrest and might get shot, my black employee is going to be leading protests in the conference room or not coming into work because they're going to a protest and then coming back and telling us, we have to restructure our whole organization because we're all racist. Why would you hire somebody like that? Rationally. Well, it, not even uh, black people, but just college students in general now. If you look at what they're being taught, you know. Why would you hire somebody like that on a rational level? Somebody who says my way is the only way, anybody that thinks even a little bit differently. I never have to consider anyone else's rights and needs, just the group that's in front of me that I am giving just unquestioned submission to. Mm -hmm. What are we teaching people? But in order to get to them, we cannot get to them through logic and ration. We have to use emotion. That's how they were indoctrinated. Just like taking somebody out of a cult. You cannot get someone to change cult thinking with ration and logic. That's a different part of the brain. You have to use the same kind of emotion and other techniques that were used to indoctrinate them to free them from that indoctrination. Kind of like being an anti-woke Pied Piper then. There's so many good people who look at racism, look and say, well, wait a minute, if we have all these pro protests, is racism still such an issue? And they say, if, there is, if it is, I want to be someone who addresses that. So it's good people all over the country. But right now, their only option is critical race theory. So all black people victims, all white people bad, 
the end, send your check here. So they need an alternative to that. And what's the alternative? What's, what's my your, program? I, like, I have a, a, a video. If you look up on YouTube, uh, systemic racism, final version. <laughs> I put that on there because I just wanted to show people that systemic racism does exist. It isn't completely gone, but you'll notice embedded within it. I talk about the fact that if we don't address racism correctly, our whole society is going to fall over. That it's really important for those of us who care to do something about it. But if we want something that's going to last and not just result in extreme backlash, not cause our whole society to fall apart, we have to handle it delicately. We have to do it a certain way. Teaching white people that they're all racist is not the way. Showing where bias comes from and how we all get influenced by bias Mm -hmm. takes the, the finger pointing away. Most people are fascinated to know how their brain works. Yeah, yeah. So if you, like, with the examples we use, and I got one of these, you know, a couple of these examples from my sister who teaches a diversity training to law enforcement in Minnesota. And she's like an uber lefty. She's been totally indoctrinated to wokeism. But there's a part of her brain where critical thinking resides, and that's where we meet. And she uses an example, for instance, talking about realizing she had bias and she just didn't like this candidate. She was helping the the state police recruit and a candidate came in and they thought he was great. And she's like, no, there's something about this guy. I just don't like this guy. You know, she's like, oh, I don't like this guy. And she later realized it, it was because he had his shoes were dirty. He had a nice suit and, you know, clothes and everything for his interview. But his shoes were dirty. And growing up in a military family, it was in, ingrained in us early about shining your shoes, about it being a sign of respect to clean your shoes and never go someplace with dirty shoes. And she didn't realize until later, she's like, I'm so biased against that guy because I have been brought up to think shiny shoes were so important. So she went back to the recruiters and said, forget everything I said okay. and base your opinion on him on what you guys picked up. Because I was so busy looking at his dirty shoes, I probably missed some of it. Now, see, that is a non-racial case that everybody can relate to, to start thinking about where is my bias? But also, because I'm a social psychologist, I come in and show you where you got it and show you that while on a superficial level, Media has become less racist. In the secondary and tertiary messages that are picked up by the parts of our brain that I discussed before, the limbic brain, the reptilian brain, there's still a lot of racism in there. So people are being biased and thinking, oh, I'm a bad person. No, you're not a bad person. You've just been, you're still being taught this stuff. So I'm going to show you how to spot when someone's trying to influence you And if it's inconsistent with your values, I'm going to show you how to turn it off. I'm going to show you how to turn away. I'm going to show you how to get alternative information so these people don't control what you truly believe and how you live your life. You bring up uh, the example of children uh, with, with your sister, your childhood. What's happening now is critical race theory is explicitly being put into the heads of children. So we're going to they're, – they're creating a whole generation that's going to have these biases, uh, which, which is rather scary to me because it, it seems if you look at the pedagogy, they're teaching children to judge each other based on skin color. Uh, explicitly, what what you're bringing out that there are implicit biases taught to us in media or in our culture, and what I see with regards to critical race theory via Robin DiAngelo, oh, dude. is that you you basically just call it white people fragile. It, it, it really, even though she explicitly says guilt doesn't matter, she is really drawing upon a very deep Catholic, negative Catholic tradition of guilt. Your program, it feels like so far, but I don't know the the specifics of it, doesn't rely on guilt 
What does it rely on then? So what, what is the proper way of dealing with these biases? I, I would say it relies on the fact that m- most of us want to see ourselves as good people. Most of us want to see ourselves as fair. Those who are trying to manipulate us, those who've been successful at manipulating our culture, have been very good at linking being a good person and being fair with a list of beliefs and social norms that you advocate with no discussion of any other alternative view. So it's this way or the highway. Hmm. Anytime they're forced to have a dissenting view, they get the most extremist, unreliable example of opposition that can be easily dismissed by their audience, by whomever those people are. And one of the thing is, I with my healing the rift, I'm very much in a hurry to get it get it out there because they are indoctrinating the children. And children have absolutely no way of, they have no, their brains aren't fully developed. Our brains aren't fully developed until we're around 25 years old. So when you're saying they're indoctrinating children, I'm including college students as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their, Their brains don't have the higher executive order thinking. They see the world in black and white. Mm. Um, All of us have some of the biases. And one of the things I talk about in the program is, where does bias come from? It is natural. The us and them mindset is a natural way our brain forms patterns in order for us to put most of our energy on those who have the most influence on our survival. So those people we see as our group. It does not make you a bad person. It can be overridden if you if you know what to do. And I teach people what to do. <clears throat> but so I also you- I teach people how to override that. Oh, the us and them mindset. But you, I also, you think that we can actually transcend tribalism? Is that oh, is absolutely. that possible? Okay. Really? Yeah. One thing, all we have to do is really extend the, who we see as our tribe. Yeah. So I, I work within the system. And where I also, I think it's absolutely crucial, and I've been talking about this for a while. When I started my un, uh, Unmasking the Abuser um podcast back in April because everybody was locked in and I said this is a great time to get this information in their hands I've been wanting for a while to also do a podcast series to a YouTube series on influence just showing people how we're influenced and showing people how to actually shield themselves from that influence some influence mechanisms are so powerful Many of the influence mechanisms that have brainwashed people to be woke and to be anti-Trumpers, those mechanisms, social psychology at this time, does not really have any effective ways of shielding yourself, except changing the channel, turning it off, turning away. They, their success rate is not based on intellect. It's not based on circumstance. Their success is based on saturation levels. Hmm. So the more it's like, of course, a lot of people hate Trump. It it is an, a perfect example of how to get a population to believe something with no real evidence for what they believe. They did it brilliantly. I'll be able to do a graduate course on this hmm. because on every level, from humor. To, I mean, I was watching a show called Underground about the Underground Railroad. Hmm. And they had a character that was supposed to be Harriet Tubman. So we're talking about the 1800s. We're talking slavery. And she does like a breaking the fourth wall segment where she's talking about Trump at the end and anti-Trump and racism. And Hamilton did the same thing where they get people all wired up and dancing and singing, which of course is you're highly influenced at this. These are mechanisms to make you easily influenced. And then they add in anti-Trump stuff in there. Hmm. It's woven into humor, cartoons, uh, random things where you're watching something completely different and they'll just so- stick something in about Trump is evil. When I'm dealing with with my, my mom and sister, for instance, who only watch 
um, news and watch films and watch things where the anti-Trump message has been woven through. Mm -hmm. So I would just rationally ask them, well, what about this? And they would say, but Trump, but Trump, okay. Hmm. So this guy's doing all this, but Trump actually called somebody a poo-poo head on Twitter, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're weighing selling our country to the Chinese. Yes. The same as Trump calling somebody a poo-poo head on Twitter and you expect me to think you have rational judgment. But for me, what it was a sign of, not their judgment or an intellect, but the level of indoctrination to which they've been exposed. Yeah, exactly. What does that show us, if we extract it from the people who are listening right now who are having a very deep uh, negative reaction to us not being negative against Trump, what is this showing us about the manipulation that we are uh, susceptible to, our country is susceptible to. Does that does that really show us that we're at a new level of of manipulation, or is this just something that's always latent in our society? Uh, well, as I said, I can only talk to the last twenty years or so. Yeah. Because before that, I didn't have the knowledge base or the the brain compl develop brain complexity to actually analyze it and I haven't had the time to actually go back to the 90s and before I can tell you this in the last 20 years I have seen a widespread movement of social indoctrination that is straight out of the social psychologist handbook I am absolutely certain that people promoting a lot of what the woke support are social psychologists with the same background I have so why don't I think that way too because I know enough that when I see shows that have woven these influences within them, I don't watch them anymore. Okay, yeah. I recognize, you know, the first thing they told me when, we got, when I got to Stanford for graduate school, because I got my master's and my PhD from Stanford, when I got there, the first thing they told us is knowledge of a phenomenon does not make you immune to its effects. And one of the effects that you face if you don't go along with social indoctrination, especially at the level it's being put on us now, is social isolation. I've lost contracts behind the fact that I won't give the password that Trump is evil. All I had to do is they weren't going to really press me on it. But if I was willing to go along that Trump is responsible for all wrongs since the flood, I would have been accepted with open arms. I've literally lost hmm. huge amounts of money. So now I'm in the position where I have to go to the conservatives to get funded to teach everybody, conservative or liberal, or however you label yourself, to teach people how to spot when people are trying to indoctrinate you to believe something. And then you stand back and say, okay, is this consistent with the beliefs that I hold? If so, I'm not worried about it. But I would be really careful about any source that uses indoctrination because they'll often start off with beliefs that you share and then start moving into beliefs that you don't. And by then you're so immersed in the group and so and, and so aware of the punishment mm. that will be an aspect of not going along unquestioningly like everyone else, that you'll end up holding beliefs or claiming you hold beliefs that are completely contrary to not only where you started, but anything that would be benefit you or your family. This is why we have all these people, white people, signing on. To this, and we have straight people signing on to things about all straight people are bad, all white people are bad, white males are the, the axis of evil. All, I mean, mm -hmm. just all of this. And these are people who belong to those groups because they know that should they stand back and say, well, wait a minute, that's not fair, they will be completely rejected, they will be vilified, they'll be doxxed, people will come after their kids. 
it takes real courage to stand up right now and say, no, I'm not going to go along with this. Is there a way to in, inoculate courage into people rather than uh, indoctrinate courage into people? I would say one of the reasons I've been so courageous in my life is it's here's something you're not going to hear often. One of the benefits of racism. It's like I was treated like a bald headed stepchild by my professors at Stanford okay. because they were expecting a white girl to show up. And here I come. Mm -hmm. So private university, they can do what they want. I could do a Netflix drama on the racism I experienced. Mm -hmm. One of the things about that, though, there were benefits. What are the benefits? When you are treated like an outsider, it gives you a degree of objectivity of the patterns of what's going on that you don't neither see and you have no investment in because you're outside the group. So you're watching the pattern emerge. You're watching the behavior and you're seeing it. And you have nothing to lose by being objective because you're already pushed out of the middle anyway. Just like at Stanford, being treated so poorly by them, um, one of the things it did, it strength, okay, it traumatized me completely. The first time I went back to the university after graduation, hmm. we were driving from Southern California where I lived, and I started shaking like this when we approached the turnoff to go to Stanford because I'd been treated you know, almost six years of being absolutely brutalized by these people. But what it did was it made me know that any argument I make, I have to be able to back up 25 ways from Sunday. I, didn't ex I don't ever expect to get a free pass on any of my beliefs. I can prove anything I say. But that that could have gone a different way. You could have been filled with resentment and the opposite of, or, or uh, that their racism could have turned into your own racism. What was it about you that allowed you to, I don't know, alchemically process that trauma and not want to go out and wreak havoc on white men, let's say? Why am I not bitter? Because bitter wouldn't carry me forward. What, what is the saying that hatred is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die? <laughs> yeah. I, and in my life, for all of the racism I face from my professors at Stanford, for instance, I, there have been arbitrary people throughout my life, and I have goosebumps even thinking about it, who've been so brilliant, who've been so supportive. And if I started saying all white people bad, I am betraying what these people did for me. And I'm not going to do that. If I say all men are bad because of domestic violence, I know so many wonderful men. I'm betraying that. I am not going to do that. So how do you, how do we, I, I look at, I went to this college that really indoctrinated the students into critical race theory. And by the end of it, it had changed the demeanor of everybody. Everybody became racist in a way. The white people mm -hmm. would cower and the black people would, would assume the worst out of every situation. So I saw a very extreme version of critical race theory. And then 2020 kind of brought back some of that trauma because it kind of uh, is rising now in Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. You forget about the riots. The real problem is in the bureaucracies right now. What are some of the attitudes that you think, uh, let's say the good meaning white liberal who's being taunted or tempted by wokeness, what are some of the positive values that still have the same end result of, of diminishing racism? What, what, what are uh, like just a couple of tips or, or like, like the value where we can start? I would say a lot of times anger dissipates if people are willing to listen. So put into a situation where when somebody's saying this happened to me and you actually listen. But you also have to be strong enough to say, I will not put myself in a situation where myself and my family are disadvantaged due to historical crimes by people I'm, my relatives weren't even here yet, okay? That doesn't help us. How do we build from here? I think yeah. that's why I called my program Healing the Rift. How do we build from here? We know these things occurred. We know that there are shadows there. But taking on guilt for crimes you didn't commit just makes you vulnerable to manipulation. Okay. 
So having that in the back of your mind, I can be empathetic, but not give you, but still tell you no. Yeah. When you ask me for something, I am, you know what? I am really sympathetic. Let's see if we can come up with a situation that will serve both of us because I am not willing to make myself and my family vulnerable. I am not willing to teach my children to hate themselves and their parents. We either come up with a a new situation or my answer is uniformly no. Um, And yes, I can, I can, I can teach people how to do this. Hmm. And very specifically, as I said, one of the benefits, extreme racism, I can back it up. I can easily, anything I do, it has to be easy. I don't want people to have to invest a huge amount of time because they get bored. Um, I won't have anything that says you're all bad. PayPal me. (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> well you could probably do uh the opposite you're all wonderful people here's my paypal yeah right <laughs> uh, or, or do what one kid i actually put a joke up on twitter because one person said a, a young black girl said her brother was selling passes to his white friends to use the n-word and <laughs> so far he'd he'd earned almost a thousand dollars and i said hey that's the ticket so any white people, I can absolve you and forgive you for any of your, uh, you know, unconscious racism. Send me money, and of yeah. course, my followers, for the most part, knew I was joking. Ha ha ha! ha. I got a couple of serious offers. Do you want me to send you? No, I don't. Block. <laughs> Creepy. No. <laughs> pay me for my work. Don't pay me mm. for your guilt. I am not selling indulgences. Mm-hmm. I'm actually helping people so that we can come together as a country, so that we can act. And somebody even trusted me enough to say, why should I be anti-racism when, as a white person, racism benefits me and my family? Hmm. And I thought, great question. I thought, great question. Here's why. Why? Because when we utilize every mind in our country, because we're not the only country in the world, although in America we tend to think that way, We are competing against the rest of the world. When we strengthen our country by coming together as a country, we, with our, our ideology, our faith in the divine combined with the innovation that is in our soil, I think we will be unstoppable right now. We are wasting resources. Some of our best minds are either in jail or working as independent pharmaceutical distributors in the ghettos. Mm. I got that term from my sister. <laughs> She's That's a like, good term. <laughs> she had a radio, she has a great voice, had a radio show. She was getting all of these guys from jail saying, Oh, I just love you. And she's like, Oh, all these independent ph- pharmaceutical distributors who, <laughs> <laughs> who got caught and are now in jail. So, but if you look at some of the networks run by the criminals in the ghettos, there's some brilliant people that should be running corporations. Yeah. We do this right. We're stronger than ever. We allow people to keep disrespecting our flag, disrespecting the the blood that people have shed for our country. We are helping nobody. We are making racism rational. And even those people who submit now out of fear, that anger is, is quietly boiling in their stomach. And it's going to erupt if we don't do something about it, because they know that what they're being asked to submit to, asked to to disrespect is one of their core values. And doing that doesn't help us. So, yeah, I can take I'm not going to quite give you an indulgent or a free pass for for using the N word, but I can show you how to grow a pair. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> somebody asked me because of course the Australian media for the most part is very anti-Trump and they're like oh aren't you embarrassed about him I said why I said in America when we hire a president who has balls we expect him to use them <laughs> <laughs> and I said eh, the fact that he said I'm taking care of my own before I take care of other people I said don't you want to? nah I'm not embarrassed hmm so people expect as a black person, I'm going to join in the Trump derangement syndrome. 
No. Hmm. Now, I don't agree with everything he says. Sometimes I'm going, oh, God, Donald, please don't say that. Don't call that guy a nitwit on Twitter. Come on. that Twitter is forever. The Internet lasts. Don't do that. <laughs> but when it comes to actual decisions, yeah. black people have done better under Trump than we did under Obama. And then they're because of that empowerment. Because he's just looked and said, he thinks like a businessman. And he was so supported in the black community before he ran for president, because in many ways, Trump thinks and acts like a black guy. Hmm. You know, he's arrogant about what he does well, and he can back it all up. He said, look, I am the bomb. He gets in this president, the economy's booming. And it's like, you can't fault the guy. He wasn't lying. Okay, no, he wasn't modest, but he never claimed to be. But neither are <laughs> most black men. Hmm. Get a black guy that's really good at basketball and see what he says about himself. Get a, look at Muhammad Ali, and he's like, you know, come against me, and you're you're flat on the ground. I mean, and everybody applauded. So black people really liked Trump because he did not have a reputation as a racist until they decided to turn all black people against him. And there are a lot of people who've been Black people who've been conditioned, they hear the R word. And immediately their brain shuts off and their heart starts thumping and it triggers. A lot of white people too. It triggers a primal fear that's been the difference between death and survival. That's true. Yeah. And the people who triggered that knew what they were doing. All you have to do is call somebody a racist. And a lot of back black people will stop thinking. And when you look at the facts that he's giving loans and money to, to historical black colleges, black unemployment's at the lowest rate since the 1960s before manufacturing left our yeah. urban areas. He's actually put a program in, in place to um, look at, examine, and undo some of the sentencing, racist sentencing in the prison system that has resulted in, in uh, even if you, when you look at my video, my video is only for, I took all of systemic racism and boiled it down to 14 minutes. Okay. So I had to leave some things out, but one of the things I talk about is the fact that black people are seven times more likely than white people to be wrongly convicted of murder. Hmm. Hmm. We get longer sentences. If we commit a crime, it's harder for us. Our lives aren't seen as valuable. So we're more likely to get a jail sentence where someone else would get time served or parole. The system's very unfair, and Trump actually did something about it, and he didn't have to. He had such a small base of black voters in the first election. He could have been really obnoxious and been like Reagan and said, okay, you didn't vote for me. I'm not doing anything for you. Hmm. But he didn't do that. Because I think on a core level as a businessman, he looks at America as a business, and how do I get this business to be the most successful I get the best performance out of every layer. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we have to gain by healing the rift, by getting rid of residual racism, but not replacing anti-black racism with anti-white racism. Mm -hmm. That's making it worse. And my God, you never disrespect the flag. You do not kneel during the, the when they when the national anthem is played. You say the Pledge of Allegiance, we don't need less of that, we need more. Hmm. Because that, that you're in America now, we're all Americans, we're all going towards the same goal is why America is so strong. We don't have that here in Australia. And what we have, I live in a state that's all, that's filled with ethnic enclaves. And if you look at Boston, if you look at Chicago, you look at some of the other highly segregated cities, they've had ethnic enclaves that have so much discord and it's gone on for centuries because people don't live together. If you don't live together and you don't go towards the same goals, you're never going to unite. All it's going to take is any type of tension and you're going to be at each other. You're going to be competing against each other. You're going to be, there's going to be animosity. Mm -hmm. That's not our goal. But also, if we're going to fix the racism, the residual systemic racism that is still, that the black community is still paying for, black people have to be willing to look at what are we supporting? What are we promoting? Who are all those huge 
um, for the most part, all of the, the violent protests have been in support of career cr criminals, violent career criminals. Is that the best we can do? Is this representing the best of our people? I'm not saying anybody deserves to be killed by the police if they're unarmed or if it's unjust. But is that the best we can do? Um, we have to get away from the single parenthood. We have to get away from the, I mean, I had family, my woke family, the part of the ones I was saying I'm doing some work with, with this uh, healing the rift. Oh, at the Black Lives Matter protests and everything, I said, well, why aren't you protesting these rap singers and hip hop singers that are advocating values that are destroying our community? Why are you just blaming everything on the cops? They're end game. The problem begins much, much, much earlier than that. Now, if you want to include them in the problems, that's fine. But what about this other stuff? What about picking Cardi B to interview Joe Biden? What does <laughs> that was she weird. What does she represent? So this is sending a mis message to, because she's, first of all, she's black Latina. So I guess they were being lazy and figured we'll just get two groups for one. But there's nothing about this woman that represent, represent, represents anything but the most base and vile aspects of black culture. Black women have been hypersexualized since we were stolen, and it has been used as an excuse for why black women can't be raped. If you look at the population of who's most likely to be trafficked, it's black girls. Our sexual assault rate is significantly higher than the rate for anyone else. Our domestic violence rate, serious domestic violence rate, along with that of Native American women, is the highest in the country. Our murder rate, our rate of being murdered is more than twice as high than any other group. Hypersexual imagery of black women is not helping us and never has. It makes money for the few women who are representing themselves that way, but they have bodyguards. Hmm. When you are identified with that person, when you are encouraged to dress and behave that way, all it's doing is making women vulnerable. For me, I'll tell you something in the media that's had an, a direct impact on my life, and that's Hidden Figures. That film about the black women who worked for NASA. Yeah, it made me ball. One of the issues working in Northern Territory and working with Aboriginals is that the black until Black Lives Matter, which they decided to jump on, which has not been... Oh, I have issues about that, too, because they have a different history. But since I've been here, the, the Aboriginals do not identify with Black Americans at all. And it's, it's put a real limitation on my ability to get my programs into the Aboriginal community. But your and programs I, translate oh, absolutely. to anybody. that situation. Okay, yeah. So I took it to the Maori next door in New Zealand, and they're like, yeah, come along. We've got a problem with that. But the Aboriginals have been resistant, saying we have a different history. And then I went to, and gave a talk in Northern Territory, and the Aboriginal woman, an Aboriginal woman who was there giving the initial, what they call welcome to country, where they say, you know, this is the traditional land of these people and whatever. Okay. So she waits for me when I finish my talk. And it, we started talking, saying, she said, you know, I'd like for you to come out and visit our community. And I was like, yay, finally. And then she admits to me why she felt she could talk to me. She said her husband has hidden figures on, on a DVT and he watches it on an endless loop. He just thought mm -hmm. these women are amazing. So she sees a woman who looks and sounds like one of those women. And she approached me to come and talk to her community. I could have cried. I owe the producers of Hidden Figures yeah. a thank you. It, this stuff has real life consequences. So, so, and, and you're bringing that up because Cardi B represents one thing and hi Hidden Figures rep represents something else. And it really does have a f impact in how people view. It has a real world view. impact on people. When you, when the only imagery that people see of you is as somebody hypersexualized who's 
tweaking on on in the internet twerking, or twerking 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 whatever um see how out of touch i am my my daughter's like you are so not cool i'm like yes i don't want to be cool but, it, but um with these hypersexual and and always pushing the envelope further mm-hmm. it has real world consequences so when they talk about unconscious bias and implicit racism try what happens if a black woman can accuses a white guy of rape and the judge has been seeing black women represented like this too yeah. how likely are you to be believed i mean rape is hard to convict get convictions for less than what 5% are actually resulting convictions you, in most urban cities they don't even put test all the rape kits <laughs> what well, that's another thing that that uh, trump got them to do actually t- test the rape kits in the urban areas really? where they're finding serial rapists because they're testing the DNA from these rape kits that they said, oh, it's too expensive. And they didn't even bother testing them before. That was Trump. So I'm looking at the reality and I'm looking yeah. at what's being presented to people. And it's, we need to do what's in our best interest. And our best interest is for us to be a united country. A respectful country and not only respect for people who claim they're the latest, biggest and brightest victim, but where everybody's rights are respect. But my dad also always said, your right to swing your arms ends where my nose begins. (laughs) So protecting people's rights does not mean taking the rights from other people. We got a lot of work to do, but yeah. thank you. I thank you for giving me an opportunity because we need to get the word out. I need to get back there. I need, especially Washington State. I can stay with Carolyn. You guys are in deep doo doo. I mean, wow, the woke have taken over. Yeah, they are pushing pretty hard. So, your your program, healing the rift. Mm-hmm. When is that? Is that going to be? How is that going to be accessible to people? Well, they can contact me on my unmasking the abuser email. I'm more than happy to send. Um, Will you brief... be making a podcast or a web series or a Zoom seminar? Uh, I can I, all all of the above. So, okay. as I said, I've I already have one video out where okay. it explains explains systemic racism, and I made that as at the request the direct request of Lawrence Fox in the UK. Lawrence Fox is an, a non-woke actor who made the mistake of going on national television there and actually saying something, and the world came down on his head from a great height. Um, he was blacklisted. He has his agent dropped him, but he's been getting donations to go into politics. They said somebody's got to stand up to these people, mm-hmm. and he made a comment that systemic racism does not exist anymore. And I said, yes, it does. He followed me, sent me a direct message and said, show me. Okay. So I took a two and a half hour seminar, boiled it down to 14 minutes. (laughs) It includes information from the UK and the US. But if you look up, as I said, systemic racism, final version, it's on YouTube. And you can see Uh, a basic outline. And you can contact, my agent's number is on there. But you can also contact me by email at unmaskingpodcast at gmail.com. All the contact information will be in the description along with your Twitter handle. Okay. I really hope that, th- that you I don't come get over doxed. here. <laughs> what? That you don't what? <laughs> that doxed. I don't get completely doxxed, yes. <laughs> I've had somebody who disagreed with me not being woke try to get me both thrown out of Australia and um, lose my job. Yeah. They can just kick you out of Australia? I mean, it is an island. N- well, I have a good visa, but they, they actually tried to get me thrown out. They actually tried to get me fired from my job because I don't agree with the woke philosophy and I see through it. And... I'm not going to say it didn't hurt and it didn't scare me. Of course it did. Yeah. But. Well, you're a threat then. 
Yes. That's showing you something. Compl- it's in a weird way. It's a compliment. Yeah. And I didn't get where I didn't get through Stanford by being a weakling. So if you expect somebody that's not going to fight back, be <laughs> wrong woman. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but it was scary because I didn't know what they do. I knew they couldn't throw me out of the country because well, I put it on Twitter that what had happened. And I got contacted from a professor in the law department at Harvard, a black woman, and said, tell me if you need me, I'll bring my legal team over. So we would have had an international case, which would have had trade implications if they would have actually followed through on that. Wow. So I I, I came to win. I didn't just come to play. Okay. So if you want to win, you want a fair society, you want to be treated well, you want to be able to be proud of who you are, whomever you are, then I need to be on your team. Congratulations for reaching the end of the podcast. If you enjoyed this product, consider donating to this channel via paypal.me slash Benjamin Boyce or joining me on Patreon. Also follow me on Twitter at Benjamin A. Boyce. Have a good night.